thank you all for coming out tonight. Story Strings, the Guitar in Amer American Art. This ex exhibition, it's a premise, one of the guiding theses of it is that the guitar as a mo motif uh, gives artists and their human sub subjects uh, a means to address themes and to tell stories that otherwise might go undertold or untold all to together. And when I started organizing this pro project, I knew that I needed to rely, uh, as it's said in a play, on the kindness of stra strangers. The two strangers who have since become uh, good, friendly co colleagues are Walter Carter and Joe Gla Glazer. Um, they're both quoted through it in places in the exhibition catalog. They both received more phone calls from me than the, in, in emails than they probably wanted to. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about each, each of them. Walter Carter and his wife, Christy, founded Carter Vintage Instruments in 2012, an enormous and an enormously wel welcoming guitar shop in, Nash in Nashville. He has a few callings, ac actually, including having spent a decade as Gibson's in-house historian. He's written and co-authored several books on vintage guitars and guitar firms, including Gibson, 100 Years of an American Icon, Groon's Guide to Vintage Guitars, and the Mammoth Guitar Collection. Now, what can we say about Joe Glazer? Well, if you are a Nashville session or touring or any mu musician and your guitar needs work or any type of repair or improvement, such as the Glazer B or G Bender, chances are you are going to take your guitar to Glazer Instruments run by. Joe Gla Glazer, and itself, itself a, a shop of master te technicians. As with Walt Walter, Joe is a modest guy, and he would not ad advertise this, but his clientele does read like a who's who of country and rock royalty, among other gen gen genres. Most of all, these are two really great guys who are not only guitar gen geniuses, but have been most, ge most generous with their time and not knowledge, and I would like to ask, ask you to join me in welcoming them to, um, to the stage to have a conversation about some of the instruments they have ha handled. Joe, Walter. <laughs> so, welcome to Richmond, Virginia. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. And Thanks thank for stopping you. the rain. Yeah. I hope I, you I, did. I had a lot to do with that. Um, so both, both of you are le lenders to the ex exhibition. Joe, um, you lent the, the Gibson L, L5 at left and the Super 400N at right. Um, tell, us, tell us about your relationship with these two in instruments and what, what they mean. Well, first I need to rely on, on Walter for actu actual uh, correct facts about these, but I'm going to just sort of wander in. These were the two, th these are our two early blonde Gibson archtops. Th these were the, the fanciest and the second fanciest guitar they made at the time, wartime, that being the Second World War, um, 37 and 39, a little bit before that. Uh, they, were, they were made for big band players. Uh, they... Um, they're, they're, they're kind of related to each other. The one on the left came, uh, was played by a studio player, Ray Eddington, who, who played in Nashville for years and years. And before that, I forget what her name was, but a, 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 a jazz player, a woman who was um, an accomplished uh, jazz guitarist. That was played on Elvis records. That was played on a lot of stuff. It wasn't, it, it was used as a rhythm guitar, not necessarily as a jazz guitar when it was used on sessions. To me, these two represent the finest work that Gibson did in their heyday, in that this was the most expensive, uh, the arch tops were where the focus was, and also not, not just about sound, which was supposed to project out enough to be played from the stage, but heard by people in an audience with or without a mic, but also they, they needed to look really elegant. And so 
early on, I, I started um, collecting this kind of instrument. I bought that from a guy who had played in a big band, who had retired to a trailer in Hollywood, Florida. And I ran an ad in the National uh, Union magazine looking for archtop guitars. And he called me up, and I went down and visited him and, and learned, as I learned, as I saw later on, that they were all Italian. They all retired to a trailer somewhere. And, and they all eventually sold their guitar. Wow. So I actually read that Ray Edenton just passed, passed yeah, away. He, did. he just did. Yeah, very re recently. Those were the drums in country band. They didn't mm -hmm. have a, they were the backbeat, the rhythm shot. And I remember you telling me some, something about how you have this theory, which, which I believe that somehow um, the blonde or golden finish was a visual ploy as well against the tuxedos or other clothing the big band members might be we wearing. Well, again, correct me if I'm wrong or, or, or uh, don't, um, but um, <laughs> guitars came out of the violin world in a sense. And violins were always stained dark. They were shellacked and then, but with a, a dark color. And when the early guitars uh, became part of popular American uh, music, particularly the arch tops, they were all, they all had a dark sunburst. And it kind of went along with the dark Saruk rugs and the dark living rooms and all, all that kind of thing. The, the blonde, obviously little Martins, the flat top guitars, uh, the opposite was true. They were mostly natural finish and, and the sunburst or, or was, was considered to be more exotic. But for the, for the big bands, um, every, all the guitars that people play, and you have, you have video of, of Maybelle Carter also playing an early L5. They were dark, and in 35, they started experimenting with blondes. Is this true, 35, 36? About 37. Well, I have a 35, so somehow that Probably happened. 35. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. But they didn't show up in the catalog until 39. Yeah. So these were probably given to artists in, in the very beginning. It was probably something Gibson made, and they gave them to big band artists because I think they did stand out on stage. They just, they just, looked, they just looked elegant and contrasted the... Yeah. Uh, you know, one thing about guitars, and in fact, your, your title, Storied Guitars, points this out. I've worked on all kinds of interesting guitars that can only tell me the most recent part of their story. And so you don't really know. I don't really know what, well, I actually have a picture of that being played on D-Day in, 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 a, in a studio, no, in Pearl Harbor Day in the studio. The guys were sitting around playing and it hadn't happened yet. And, wow. But the date and the clock is on the wall, you know, in, in the studio picture. So some, sometimes you know these stories, but sometimes you get a guitar and all you, sure. you may know is nothing. You may, may have an incredible past that's now forgotten. Right. And to Joe's point about showing up on stage, those are big guitars. That one is uh, 17 inches wide, that one's 18. The flat tops, uh, Martins, that they call Dreadnought are only a short of 16 inches wide. So these are, these are really big guitars. Well, you lent a number of cowboy guitars and Hawaiian guitars. I saw them, yeah. To the exhibition, <laughs> yeah. You saw them, you said, that's where, where they went. Can you tell us a little? I, um, so there are a lot of dis decisions that have to be made regarding what images we're going to use for press images. And, and the other yeah. Hawaiian gu guitars yeah. had some, some people championing them, but I championed this. And um, I just think this is an extraordinarily cool instrument. Can you tell us a little bit about the Stromberg voice, voice in that? Yeah, they uh, became the K Company, uh, which became known for cheap guitars, and they made cheap guitars even before that. Uh, this would be sometime before about 1932, um, and probably a little bit earlier. That is per Lloyd, um, celluloid on the fingerboard, not ivory. Um, it was at a time when Hawaiian music was very popular, and so they did some pretty inexpensive artwork on the front. Um, the headstock is an unusual design, a little more artsy than just the straight across or rounded top that a lot of uh, most guitars have. 
Um, it's, it's remarkable that it's held together all this time. These were, these and the cowboy guitars were, were very cheaply made. There's a small cottage industry now in taking the backs off of these and rebracing the tops so that they're stronger and making sure the necks stay in. Uh, and it, it improves the sound and it uh, will give them a longer life now. You have, you have quite a few cowboy guitars. In fact, I, it's one of the, when I walk into the shop, it's one of the first things you see on the right wall. Of you know, I don't have a one. My wife has all of those. <laughs> oh, well, then I should be thanking you yeah. for yeah, the loan. Uh, usually, they can be had pretty cheaply, and they, they, they make good conversation. They're kind of, yeah. uh, and they're not all uh, confined to cowboy themes. They're, um, we've got one uh, it's called the Red Devil, and it has a, it's red and has a devil on it. And uh, you, didn't, you didn't pick that one. But, uh, you know, interestingly enough, though, a guitar of that exact model um, is mostly just on display places. But there's a guitar player, Al Anderson, big Al Anderson, who is in NRBQ and has become, a, over the last 20 years, written about a third of everything, every major Nashville tune. He plays as his main guitar. His, and he's a huge guy, as you know. Big Al. Yeah. His main acoustic guitar is one of these. This is a very small guitar. It's hard to tell from the photo. But it has endured as his special, inspirational, wonderful guitar. So one thing about guitars is that there's no connection between what they cost and, and what kind of, whether the music made on them is memorable. And also, there's no connection between what you might think of a guitar and whether somewhere there's one that's completely changed music because it was just the right thing for somebody. Right. Right. So why don't, we, why don't we now talk about a few instruments you all have sold or worked, worked on. Um, so when you go to Walter's website or if you're on his Instagram feed, you can see any number of celebrities coming in to play some of the best gu guitars y you've ever seen. But none of them quite like quite are this. Um, tell us a little bit about this and how you came upon this and, uh, and the history of this. In, in well, the, the, the person who owned it brought it in or called about it. I was unaware of this guitar. Um, so there's a story, and a lot of times the stories are questionable. And when somebody says this was Hank or Hank Williams played this guitar, you say, yeah, sure. Um, who else, or what other guitar? Uh, but th there was some documentation. The story is that Hank Williams had come into Nashville, went to the publishing office of A Cup Rose Music, uh, and uh, Fred Rose, who was Roy A Cup's partner and, and the main guy who ran publishing, uh, was there. Hank comes in, says, "I've got some songs," and Fred Rose said, "We'll play a few of them." And he said, "Well, I don't have a guitar." And Fred Rose hands him 20 bucks and said, well, go buy a guitar and come back and play some songs. And so Hank went to a pawn shop and paid $15 for this guitar and pocketed the other five <laughs> and, and brought the guitar in. And uh, the guitar did not remain in Hank's possession. It stayed in the Acuff Rose office. It was just the, the office guitar there. And that story would probably be lost, as, as would the guitar. Uh, except that Fred Rose then, in 52, 3, 4, somewhere right uh, around the time Hank died, uh, gave it to a young girl singer from, I believe, Gadsden, Alabama, and the local paper uh, wrote an article about it with a picture. So there's, for once, and th this is music to our ears, documentation uh, to go with a, with a guitar like this. So. It's, it stayed in, in that family for a while. At some point, and um, we are told that it was put on display to help raise money for the uh, beginning of the Country Music Hall of Fame, which would be when? Late 60s, Joe? It was, it was pretty new when mm -hmm. I moved to Nashville in 71. So I, mm -hmm. uh, and, and there was this huge, it, it looked like a, a funeral uh, casket or something, that, a, a plexiglass that they made for this guitar um, and that survived with it, it came, it came in. Uh, so it, the guitar was owned 
by several people through those years came to us and uh, sat in the store and you know, it really looked like a, a, a dead guitar in a, in a cast. But um, there, there was the documentation with it and um, help me, who was the, Luke Combs. Uh, Luke Combs was barely known at the time as a country star. Uh, he had come in our shop quite a bit, and, and so we knew him. It, it had known him since before he had much going. Uh, he came in and he bought it. So that's where it resides now. Did he give it to the Hall of Fame? Or lent it to the Hall of Fame? So Did he it finally buy the coffin too? No, he didn't want that. Uh, we gave it to the first person who agreed to take it away. <laughs> it, was, it was it weighed two or three hundred pounds. You know, to, to Walter's part, uh, to his point, quite often you hear that um, Hank had, or anybody, had this guitar and that guitar. It would have kept him quite busy because the, the, this, yeah. there's 2,000 stories of, of guitars Hank or whoever else had. Um, the, part of the other story about the Hank Williams going into A Cuff Rose is that it, Hank, I presume on this guitar, played played uh, Fred wrote some songs and Fred said, how do I know you wrote these? And he said, uh, write, a so write a song and gave him something it had to be about. And Hank, on the spot, on that day, wrote Mansion in the Hill, mm -hmm. which, which is, if you guys know your Hank Williams, mm -hmm. you know is an incredible yeah. song. So, so, and I assume that story's true. A lot of these stories may or may not be true. Mm -hmm. There's a guitar... Marty Stewart has a, uh, a Martin guitar that he got from Johnny Cash, that, and he worked with Johnny Cash and his son-in-law and all that stuff. Over the years, that story has grown to include being also previously owned by Hank Sr., which it probably wasn't. There's little, there's only a tiny bit of evidence. So a lot of these stories, even if they don't, even if they're not true, if they're if they go through the right hands, and they're told long enough, the story becomes as important as if it were true. I think on a on a different level, um, even good guitars played by non celebrity just civilians, I think that the good guitar carries stories. It seems like it always yeah. does. Um, yeah. So, oh boy, Merle Haggard. Yeah. Uh, so you sold this. Yeah, yeah. Down in the corner is, is an album that Merle Haggard did uh, called Same Train, Different Time. I think that's it. Uh, it's a tribute to Jimmy Rogers, and the father of country music, who was a huge star in the very early 30s and then died young of uh, TB. So you see the picture of, of Jimmy Rogers with his thumbs up. Uh, and then Merle, dressed up like a train engineer, doing the same thing. The Rogers guitar is a Martin, or possibly a Wayman, I'm not sure, uh, probably his Martin, that uh, has his name inlaid on the fingerboard. So Merle had Merle Haggard inlaid on the fingerboard of his. And at some point, Merle had too many guitars and gave this guitar to his friend, whose name was Glenn Martin, uh, who was a songwriter and also ran Merle's publishing company in Nashville. Uh, Glenn's best known song was a Merle hit called, uh, No, It's Not Love, But It's Not Bad. So, uh, and Glenn and his wife uh, brought that guitar in for us to sell. And while we had it, uh, it was kind of a special moment for me and the, and, and the guys in the store. The, um, the trade organization, National Association of Music Merchants, NAM, uh, has a promotion every year uh, they, call, uh, they call Making Music Day. And they try to get every store or, or NAM members to promote some kind of musical event. So we usually had, you know, threw together some little thing in our store, uh, just a quick jam. Uh, and that's any time in Nashville you have three seats, you're actually going to get three songwriters there and they'll, they'll start playing. Uh, so we uh, pulled out a bunch of Merle Haggard songs, and I hogged that guitar mostly, and, but let some of the other guys play it. So 
for 20 or 30 minutes, we, we played Merle Haggard songs on that guitar. And then, once again, who bought it? Luke Bryan. See, I, I get the Luke's mixed up. Uh, yeah, well, you're welcome. Yeah. We can trade. You want to? It is suggesting you take my seat. <laughs> this is my wife, by the way. Yeah, okay, just uh, yeah. Luke Bryan uh, uh, came in and bought it. Uh, as far as I know, he still owns it. And, uh, but it was it was really great uh, having that guitar in the shop and being able to touch it and and, and play songs, Merle Haggard songs on it. Very, very cool. But also cool in a very different way. Is you ready for for this, folks? Oh, we don't. Oh. <laughs> um, Where did you get this? I don't. You know, I tried to find that out when I, I sent you that picture, I, and I don't remember specifically the guy who brought it in to yeah. to sell it. I never heard of the maker. Dark Star is a is a guy, uh, an individual maker, I think, in the Midwest. Uh, who uh, doesn't make guitars really like that, it's, uh, except I think that one was on his website also. Um, and he just called it steampunk. At the time, I, was, I didn't even know what that term meant, but now, now I do. And it's got, um, I don't know whether that's an air gauge or a, a decibel meter or you know, something. It's just got cool stuff built into it. And, I don't. I can't remember who bought it either. Very cool stuff. Um, and yet cooler. Oh, <laughs> that is. <laughs> that's Bo Diddley. Uh, his grandson brought this guitar in that Bo had made. Uh, it's it's not nearly as well made as it looked. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think he, he, he must have a bandsaw or, or something at home that he cut out the body with. But right there next to his face is a flip-up CD player that is built into the guitar and has its own output and actually works. So you can play a CD in that player, plug the CD uh, output into an amp and plug the guitar into an amp, play along with it. Um, that was, uh, that's probably the, one of the best conversation pieces we've ever had, and, but not a sale. So it's, it's still, uh, it, it's back in uh, Bo's family now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, so did, did you ever play it or did you ever see it working? Oh, yeah. CD work oh, yeah, we put a CD in it, and, and I don't think we had one of Bo's, but, and of course I did the, dun, 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 ba -dun, ba -dun, the Bo Diddley lick. You, yeah. you have to do that on, on, on that. Absolutely. So, at least he had the foresight not to put a cassette machine in that. Yeah. It <laughs> could be useless by now. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, at your shop, this it's a very, shop. it's in, it's in a very, I'd say, elegant, very um, boutique part of Nashville, Berry Hill, um, where all, a lot of the recording stu studios are, everything. But there's no big sign advertising Glazer in Instruments. Can you tell us a little bit about what we do see here? So first of all, Berry Hill is a city inside of Nashville. It's a one square mile city. It's its own city. 48 studios in there, and almost none of them have a sign. So, in fact, maybe none of them have a sign. You're driving down the road, and there's 24 cars quadruple parked in a parking lot too small. That's a, that's a studio, and that's in session. And so it's a low, my shop's over there because it's a low-profile neighborhood. And at one point, and so I have this house, and then behind it is a large metal building. You can't see it, which is kind of cool. Um, one of my customers painted a mailbox, this, not actually this one, this is the second one, the first one got, well, it's not, it's not there anymore. Um, they painted it like a Van Halen guitar. Eddie Van Halen, you guys know who Eddie Van Halen is, some of you? He totally revolutionized 
rock guitar in the 70s and 80s. Incredibly gifted player. And he painted his, he, he worked on his own guitars, and he painted them. And he did that by putting masking tape on and spraying over it, inspired by um, art that he probably couldn't name but had seen, modern, you know, modern American art. And um, he, the family eventually trademarked all this stuff. So somebody could, I could end up going to jail over this, over this. Um, but, it, but it stands for, in lieu of having a sign that says what we do, it stands for that. And people from all over, from, from Europe and Asia come in, they go, we made it here. We were told, look for the Eddie Van Halen mailbox. Mm -hmm. And so, well, I sent it to um, Leo because to me it really represents how, how visual art goes into instruments like that steampunk guitar and then comes back out of them again. So it's, it's kind of constantly churning and uh, sometimes successfully, not, sometimes not successfully. Joe, could, could you tell the audience here a little bit about the thing you are, actually, hold on a second here. Can you tell the audience a little bit about this device we're looking at, at here? If you Google Joe Glazer, in addition to your work during the big Nashville flood, you'll also find that he has a patent for a B bender and a G bender. Can you explain what, what these are? So I came out of the Bay Area. I'm from Missouri, but I spent a lot of time in the Bay Area. And, and I, I came of age listening to hippie country music and playing steel guitar, pedal steel guitar. And if you know what that is, that's what people call that uh, the crying sound in country music. And it is done by pitch bending. It's, it's actually, a, it looks like a table, the ironing board. What did somebody call it? The, the ironing board weeping sort of thing. But, but it has a row of pedals on the floor, and by pressing them, you can stretch the strings and do pitch bending, which is what people do on guitars with their fingers. At a certain point, starting in the 20s, people made mechanical versions of this using floor pedals. In the 60s, uh, Gene Parsons and Clarence White, who were in a band called The Birds, uh, made a very rustic version of a, of a pitch bending mechanism. Put it, they added another body onto the back of uh, an electric guitar body like that. So it's huge, but it had this lever that, that you strap, you attach the strap to it. When you push down the strap, it took one of the strings, the B string in that case, and moved it up a whole step. And this became a, and Clarence White, who was possibly the best acoustic and best electric player ever. This is like the Olympic guy who can I jump and also, uh, you know, throw the javelin. And is the world's best at both. It never happens. But he, he, um, beside being a great bluegrass guitar player, he made this into a, an iconic style that uh, people fell in love with. And I, uh, playing, I was playing in a band that, in California, and the guy I was playing for, playing with, wanted one of these things. He said, "Well, you can, you can make one. You work on that steel thing. Here, it's a big mechanical instrument." You can make one. And so I just sort of hacked something together. And it was kind of like that. So that lever sticking out of the neck plate is attached to that thing that's in the bridge. You push down on it, and it goes up a whole step. And people have gotten good at it. We've made 10,000 of these things. So yes, unfortunately, I'm associated with it in Google. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that a bad thing to be? You know, you get, you get pegged with stuff, you know? Sure, sure. Uh -oh. Sure. Another thing you are pegged with is, I, I, I didn't know which, how to show this website. Joe is the organizer of a Wikipedia, a wiki site for, it's just the, the largest online guitar archive I've ever, I, that I know of. Um, it's it's get, getwick.com. And you can really go down a r rabbit hole with, with this. Uh, and I encourage you to take a look at this. This is just, you know, there's probably 25 views of the sides, the front, the pickups, the headstock, the, the, the back, 
of this flying, flying V. It's quite a service to people like me organizing an exhibition and I, you know, I know what a Strat and a Les Paul are, but do I know, you know some lesser known names? And it's just this amazing da database. So instruments are, are very valuable. There are lots of guitars that are, that have passed a million dollars in what, what their worth is considered. And the devil's in the details. And originality is a big part of that. Has this been changed? Has that been changed? And between that, which these guys are largely responsible for creating that market, between the fact that as collectors, buyers, and sellers of vintage instruments, knowing what the details are is critically important. As a repair shop, which is what we do, um, it becomes very important to know what color are the side dots on the edge of the neck on a such and such guitar if you're restoring it. And it seems so incredibly trivial, these little things about the size of a head of a pin, if they're supposed to be red and you're replacing one of them, it better be red. Or if, they're, if they don't go up past the 12th fret and you put them up there, you've not only proven yourself to be an idiot, but you've devalued something in an irreversible way. And so in doing repair, we quite often would go to Google and find maybe a front picture, maybe a back picture, and nothing else of a guitar. We were trying to find details of what the end view or the side view or the, the, the pickups or any little thing that somebody was supposed to know a lot about. And there's no general information. And so you, you, you call the people you knew and say, hey, what color is the whatever it is. What, instead, we built a this website, and it's typically a guitar has, it can have 7,500 pictures. We, we have, it's, it's, open, it's open to the public. It's curated, so you can't take a picture of your butt and put it up there. But, but you can, every, every instrument <laughs> is considered to be semi-original, so it doesn't have to be perfect. But you can put this stuff up there, and with, with two, between four and, and 100 photos, it's a great resource, resource for research, which is a world you live in. You know, I mean, you, you, fortunately, the world you're in is very, very well resourced. But we find, even in my own shop where we've taken a lot of these pictures, quite often I find myself going to this site to look up something that I can't remember or what was it like in 1936 that it wasn't like in 1934. And so we've been building this, hoping that the world would kick in and make it a... Um, make it a, a, a resource for all vintage instruments, vintage being yesterday or older. Um, when we were speaking on, on the phone re recently, um, you encouraged me to think again about pink paisley te telecasters. And um, in the ex ex exhibition on loan from uh, Elliot Michael, and Rumble Seat Music are uh, uh, a pink Paisley Telecaster bass and a pink Paisley just Fender tel Telecaster. Um, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about Fender trying to appeal to the young, cool set and uh, how, what Paisley has to, to, to do with that? Well, Fender was a, a company at Leo Fender was an interesting guy in that he was, he came out of the radio business and he liked music but he didn't play, but he really listened to his customers. He'd bring in people he liked and say, what do you, what do you think of this? And that, that's a great attribute. Um, so they, they made, he made really the coolest, the, the, the guitar on the left, the Telecaster, still about the coolest electric guitar shape ever, and that came, that, they, they were working on that by 1949, maybe earlier, 48, 49. Mm -hmm. And um, the original ones, and he was, a, he was frugal, if not a tightwad, cheap, cheapskate. And so his earliest guitars had a bolt on neck. They were basically made like a, a picnic table or something. They weren't, it wasn't this luthery that had come out of the violin world or the acoustic guitar world or like those two Gibson art shops we looked at wasn't that at all. They were very modular. He didn't originate this, but he really, he really focused on it. And he made these, the first, the first 10 years or even more of the Telecasters, with very few exceptions, 
It was just a see-through white finish that was popular in American furniture, bedroom furniture and stuff. And at a certain point, as marketing became a thing and as they were competing with the other companies, they tried to appeal to the hippies. And so this came out in 1968. And it borrowed the Paisleys from, Paisley came out of the Middle East. It, it was, you know, I collect Persian rugs and it was, it was a fixture in Persian rugs th three, 400 years ago. Um, it kind of got into the hippie, into the hippie uh, idiom because of all the people that were traveling to India and traveling to Morocco and coming back with material they bought. It had shown up in American stuff, but it hadn't been very prominent. That was shelf paper. I don't think it was, I don't think it was um, wallpaper. It was shelf paper. It was made by a company in Ohio or something. And they put it on, and it was, it was exceedingly unpopular. Nobody liked this. There was also a blue flower version. It was totally aimed at the hippies by white guys, older white men, who really should have hired some young kids to, to help them figure out what young kids would buy. But now they're incredibly collectible. Uh, um, I think you actually have a picture of why. So these two, these two characters, James yes. Burton and Brad Paisley. James Burton probably had more massively important careers in the music business, in guitar playing, than anybody. He was, he was part of the Ozzie and Harriet show, his, um, which was the Nelsons, and Ricky Nelson was the son and had a band, and, and, and James at 16 was in the band and already a great guitar player. He went on to play with, well, he played with Merle Haggard. He did, the, he did the fundamental guitar, West Coast, twangy guitar uh, style creation. He played with Elvis. He was, he was Elvis's main and favorite guitar player. He played with, um, he, he just played Emmy Lou. Emmy Lou. He was part of the hot band with Emmy Lou and all kinds of people around that. And he's still alive. He's, he's, he's been incredibly important. I actually, I've worked on both of these guitars. This is Brad Paisley. Brad is, looks just like that now. Brad got, Brad went to Belmont University, which is a music school in Nashville. Not just music, but it, kind of the music school where if you went through that, you could go into the business. You could intern quickly somewhere. And he and, he and Frank Rogers, his buddy, decided while they were still, in, still freshmen in college that they were going to hack their way into being successful. And so Frank studied production and Brad studied songwriting and was a great guitar player. He wrote me a letter when he was 14. He said, I'm going to be on the Opry. And we hung it on the wall. But that's cute, you know. <laughs> he went on to do just that. And he, he uh, when he came to town, he came to see me because he'd, we'd already been communicating. And he bought this Paisley guitar inspired by James Burton. And also his last name was Paisley, which is pretty, pretty good. Um, and he brought it to me and asked me if I would put one of those mechanisms in. And I said, no, we don't do anything. 1968 and back is, is untouchable vintage. And he said, well. Please. And I said, well, OK. <laughs> but you're going to have to earn it. And he said, I promise you. I promise you I'll earn it. And we sat in. I remember sitting in this restaurant talking to him about this. And I think he did go out and earn it. I think he succeeded in doing it. He now has two guitars that somebody else made that look exactly like that, beaten up, exact same checks and missing. That, that wallpaper, that, that shelf paper peels off. and so. Pretty, pretty soon it looks terrible. He has two, kind of like the Saddam Hussein lookalikes. He's got these two that he can take out on the road. So his original iconic one, if something happens to it, he hasn't lost Rosebud or whatever it is. But the Paisley thing, it, it just kind of, to me, I brought it up with Leo because it's kind of how art went into guitars and not necessarily the way you expect. Now these things are incredibly popular. And um, it took two people who, just had minds of their own to make something iconic. And it wasn't on, on the first time through. The guitars would be unknown now, except for these two guys. How iconic is this Les, Les Paul? Walter, what do you think? That's uh, one of uh, uh, many with many stories. It, 
it's nicknamed Greeny. It, we were talking earlier that most of the uh, Sunburst Les Pauls from the late 50s have a name. How many were made? The records are gone, or if they ever existed. Uh, uh, the estimate is around 1,500. So that's the Les Paul standard. There were four Les Paul models. That was actually the third most expensive, not the top of the line. Um, and it's got, this one had a uh, cherry sunburst top. The, the custom, the more expensive one was black, uh, and the lower models uh, had different finishes. Uh, the, and you can't really see it on these. The real uh, money feature on these guitars is the, the degree of maple uh, wood grain in the top. So the fiddle back, yeah. The, the kind of fiddle yeah. stuff. So, yeah, tiger stripe. Uh, and there, there's a whole lexicon of uh, names for, for, for the different types of wood grain. bubbling up, and um, what are some of them? You hear the, that all the time. But anyway, that's the, the amount of grain um, of figuration in the top to make it as much as $100,000 difference in, in the price of these guitars. This is the holy grail of electric guitars. Yeah. Now. These, these, this is the $300,000, $500,000, $700,000 guitar. Not this, not this one, this model. Yeah. And, yeah, that one's probably more than, than the figures that Joe. Uh, I mean, Peter Green, uh, you know, early with Fleetwood Mac, and then Kirk Hammett with uh, Metallica. Um, Are they playing the same? That's the, that's same, the guitar. same guitar. Yeah. So Peter Green played. He played. Th there's some beautiful stuff he played. He played a tune called Albatross. When you leave, you got. Is there something better? Yeah. He was, he was incredible. He was powerful. If you, if you look at his YouTube stuff, he was powerful. And then he flipped out at a certain point. Um, LSD had probably some role in it, and he went into the, the religious extreme, and he sold the guitar and I think everything else and sort of circled the drain and, and went out of the picture. That guitar became, and it was iconic because of that, and then it sort of passed through various hands. Um, this guy in Metallica bought it, and that increased its value. Just recently, we just refretted this guitar, came into the shop. The head of Gibson brought it in with, with its current owner, and we heard about it for weeks ahead of time. Greeny's coming in. Greeny, if, if Greeny comes in, you know, and, and we try to avoid this, just like we don't have a sign on the building. We, I don't Facebook any of this stuff. And, we, tr we try to live it down. There's just no big advantage, but the word got out. Greeny's coming in. Greeny's coming in. So um, I finally got to see it, and um, pretty pretty great guitar. But the, it's history. It's just a piece of wood. If you take him out of it, and you take him out of it, and everything else, it's just a piece of wood. But they're remarkable sounding guitars, and each one of these Les Pauls has its own voice and has its own character. And now they've all got named stuff. They've got named, you know. Joe Bonamassa owns a bunch of them. He's named all those. And, and everybody who didn't have one that was named has now retro-named it. The one, Johnny, that's upstairs. Or, or it's, is it, yeah. you know. And, and they're just, it's a very interesting, it's the, the guitar, the, the 59 Les Paul, 59 Les Paul. But it, they earn it, but they're, but they're um, that's the one. Well, to con conclude, uh, I would say that, Walter, you not that long ago, sold this instrument. We did. So Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, on the left is Ed King, uh, who was with Leonard Skinner only for a short time, but long enough to uh, write the lick on uh, Sweet Home Alabama. So that's, that's all he needed to do in his career. But he was uh, a, a really good guitar. He was with the Strawberry Alarm Clock before that. So, the, um, And then on the right is Jason Isbell, current. Um, King of Americana, I guess, uh, and, and more. So <clears throat> this guitar has a name, and it's, the name is Red Eye. Uh, it's not too easy to see, but uh, the upper left part of the guitar, uh, right where that little 
switch washer or poker chip, as we call it. Um, when the guitar was new, it had a hang tag hanging off of that. And it was probably sitting in a window. Uh, and the ultraviolet rays of sunlight caused the red to fade everywhere except in that one spot. So um, you know, at times, it, depending on your angle of the lighting, that's a little more dramatic red spot there. So um, it became known as Red Eye. Ed King owned it. Ed um, was working in his yard one day, and he had put an ad in a you know, thrifty nickel or one of these those publications that used to exist uh, that he had a couple of guitars he wanted to sell. Not this one. Uh, some a car backs up his driveway, so he's suspicious and figures out very quickly these guys have come to take his guitars and they're going to kill him if he, if he doesn't hand them over. So he did. Um, years go by. Um, Ed gets other guitars. Uh, but he's always wanting to find this guitar. And he sees a picture um, from a collection uh, by a guy whose name is Dirk Zip, and his family owned tons of magazines. And Dirk had probably owns over 100 uh, Sunburst Les Pauls. And there was a picture of just a row of, of Dirk's guitars, and Ed saw Red Eye. The, the, that mark stood out. Uh, Dirk Ziff obviously being wealthy beyond imagination and not wanting to have any association with stolen guitars, just gave the guitar to Ed. Uh, so Ed was reunited with Red Eye. There was uh, some publicity about that. Um, and then uh, Ed died a few years ago, and his widow, Sharon, brought that guitar and, and others into our shop to sell it. And we, we had this little scam that we run on our friends who are good guitar players. We, we asked them if they'll just, uh, just play it for a minute and do a video uh, for us. And so uh, Jason agreed to do that and fell in love with the guitar. That was really why we wanted him to play it. Um, and so he, he tried to fight it and deny this. And uh, one New Year's morning, uh, he, he could not resist any longer, called us up, had us come down to the store uh, and called his uh, accountant and manager also and said, told her to book him at, at every used car lot opening, house party, whatever, whatever it took to pay for this guitar. And he bought it. Uh, it he loves it to this day. Um, and so you've got... Uh, not that rare a story, two artists, uh, at least, uh, uh, thinking that, that one guitar was, was the, the be-all and end-all of guitars. But, you know, um, the fact that it, it already had, that there was a previous person who, who loved it that much creates more sentimental, mm -hmm. more hyster historical and hysterical value. He called me up before he bought it. He said, I need you to do something. I need you to talk me out of buying Red Eye. <laughs> yeah, he tried. Yeah. And I said, listen, man, you, you can, you'll never know what, where those dollars go unless you put it in something that you can identify, and you'll never regret it. And he goes, well, it's really expensive. It's blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, it didn't get there by not passing through half that much first and a quarter of that much first. And these guitars get more and more valuable. And when you happen to be known and it has a provenance of having been in, in having a story before that, it's not going to get less expensive. So these artists struggle with this stuff. You know, they, they, every, it, it's not uncommon for people to call me up and, and say, man, I, I'm, I feel like, I'm, I feel like I've got a mistress I've got to get rid of. And I go, what's going on? Go, um, there's this guitar, and, and I want it. But, and somebody we already talked about tonight called me and said, hey, there's this Martin I want to buy, and it's 48000 This was some time ago when that was a lot. And um, we went and looked at it, and I said, dude, you ought to buy this guitar. 
And he said, well, you don't understand. I said, 48,000, that's a great deal. And he goes, no, 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 it's 96. And I said, well, how did that just happen? He said, well, I spent 40, 48, and then I got to give my wife 48. And I said, well, okay, what's she going to do with it? And he said, well, you know, furniture and stuff like that. And I said, okay, in five years, the furniture is going to be worth half of what it was. And then in another seven years, you're going to throw it away or give it to the next door neighbors. This guitar will be worth twice what it was. And you will, have, you will have made something with it. You will have made great music. It will have inspired you. You would have written a song. One song might pay off a Jason Isbell yeah. guitar. So that whole thing of the, of the, of the story and the visual art, because you can see the, the curly maple in this. You know, this, is, this would be mild curl, but it's still prized. That, that stuff, that visual, tactile, oral, the whole thing is, is incredibly powerful, especially since most of these guitars that are, are really loved really deliver. They're, it's not just some sort of fixation for something that's based on nothing. They really deliver it. The sound, the sound it really is special. And that's why a guy like that will sit down in, in, with something like this and they'll get, they'll get, they'll get infected and, because it's real. It, it, it's just real. And the older, the older the guitars get, the older the wood gets, generally the better sounding they get. The older the electronics get, the pickups get, the better sounding they get, and this, this stuff is, it, it's real and it's just not something you can get instantly. So there's no instant gratification around it. And so he, I was wandering around prior to, to sitting down looking at the, the American paintings the, the, in the pre-World War II or whatever that, that is unbelievable, and they don't look worse because they're old. They just get this warm, Thing and it's so real, and guitars are the same way. Yeah. Well, thank you both so very, very much for, for, for joining us tonight. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah.